Today's market call is presented by FactSet, financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow and SoFi. Get your money right all in one app. It's Wednesday, the 20th of March. I learned a lot over the last hour, by the way, which we probably won't get into. March 20th, 1 o'clock on the East Coast. A lot's going to happen over the next couple hours. I Fireworks. Think. What? What's going to happen? Fireworks. Fireworks. What's going to happen? Yeah, I like that. Feigning ignorance. What's it what's it what's is market call, by the way. That is Elizabeth Young, EY from SoFi. Yes. And we, I, who I adore, as you know. Yes. I can say that. Am I allowed yes. to say that? There's many things to I adore to about her. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I mean that sincerely. Yeah. I hope you know that. Thank you. Uh, by the way. It's not Thursday. Typically, if it's Thursday, it's Butters. bitch. It's not Thursday. It's Wednesday. <laughs> but it is a Fed day. And I love just, I just wanted to say that just to say it. Because typically, it would be EY on Thursday, and then we'd be into Butters. But it's Wednesday now. Well, she, the, the 2024. New Year. Yeah. Wednesday is owned year. by no, EY from that. SoFi new on year, Market new Call. Us. Yeah. Uh, Rangers lost last night at home. I, mm. You know, look, second period, as you know, Elizabeth knows this as well. A lot of mistakes, but they threw a lot of shots at that goaltender. I mean, Winnipeg won the game. That happens. I mean, they pay them as well. So it should come in. You know, teams don't go 82-0 and in the regular season. So you're going to win a few, you're going to lose a few. Yeah. Knicks, as I mentioned the other night, seemingly have figured things out, get healthy. I like what they're doing in New York. So what do we got a little play? What what is this little, there's like a little tournament thing that's going to go on? It's called the NC2As. No, no, no. In, in, what, what's isn't there something in the pros or we already did? Isn't there like an inner? Oh, there's a mid-season tournament which I don't that? understand. I don't know why they did that. Yeah. It makes no sense yeah. to me. I mean, it's gimmicky. Well, you as have hell. one reason why. It's uh, yeah. Probably... Well, but you know something. Well, I mean, that's for another show. That maybe we'll another do it another time. Well, you, you, you know, guy from Morristown should probably call into the Boomer. Boomer's and, back. Yeah, he was on vacation. Like, yeah, uh, maybe I'll, I'll call just... those guys tomorrow. All right. So should we get this back on the road? Because we got a we got a big yes. Wednesday's also. This is the one thing you you forgot to mention. Mike. We take questions. Q and A from the well, viewers. Throw up the rundown, oh, yeah. and you'll oh, see because yeah. oh, it's in the there. rundown. Uh, it's like we're you. doing a press countdown to Fed decision. Yep, we, we should have a clock. We should do maybe. Does valuation matter? Remember a few years ago when interest rates were zero, somebody asked Jerome Powell that question, and I'm yep. paraphrasing, but he said in a zero interest rate environment, valuations really don't matter. Turned out he was probably right. Nvidia's Woodstock hangover. I'm not really sure what that means. Maybe you can educate us, Dan. I think I understand what you're saying. There were a lot of people there. It was no, like there was a, some headlines. It was like Nvidia's Woodstock. Yeah, it makes you know, no I mean, sense. that sort of thing. Like 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 a big gathering. Yeah, I don't know that I. I think like I'm too young for that. sort of thing. Oh, yeah. and the okay. aforementioned Q and A. Yeah, there you go. There you go. You put it all together. So let's get into this. Um, thing. So normally, Liz, we will preview your note that you write every week. It's not. It's it's on the SoFi blog, but I think we have a new <laughs> address. We've been but pointing you, people to the wrong address. That, yeah. yeah. And I, is that our fault? Because I went there the other day. I wanted to read Liz's blog again because I just uh-huh. got some of the um, the headlines, uh-huh. and it's a dead link. It was really bad. So yeah, I think our folks. It's in a we spot a called on the money now on the website. Uh-huh. So at SoFi. Or you can actually, if you're on the web. On a on a computer, an yeah. actual computer, you can just go to investment so, strategy. That's right. But here's the thing: so we don't have a preview of your note because you no. haven't written it yet. You're gonna wait that's and right. see what the press. Well, that has makes to sense. Do. That yeah. makes sense. So, what are you most focused on? Because you can go follow Liz at Liz Young Strat. They all do. They, they the all. Twitter. They all follow. Yeah. Everybody watching this or listening follows. What are you focused on on the way into this meeting? That well, I'm excited about. I mean, obviously, this is one um, where we get the summary of economic projections. So we'll get an update on what the Fed thinks about unemployment at the end of the year, GDP, inflation, and what the dots say. The dots are mildly useful, honestly. Anybody out there who's not familiar with the dots, it's like one dot per vote. Everybody that gets a vote gets a dot, and then mm-hmm. a bunch of people who don't get votes get dots as well. So they're not all that useful, And then we, but we find out what the median dot is. I think there's a, a small chance that the expectation for the Fed funds rate actually goes up, meaning fewer cuts Mm -hmm. uh, than was originally planned. And we'll see what happens with inflation. We've had two hot readings so far this year. Maybe they project that inflation is higher than they originally thought. And we've had some pretty good GDP readings as well. So maybe that GDP number goes up. And that's the one thing that had been in my head, the mathematical equation that didn't follow an equal sign, where we had the Fed projecting that GDP would be one point four percent this year and somehow we were still going to generate really good revenue growth right the math margin expansion work. so maybe they have to change theirs but the other thing i would say when we tie the market to this 
over the last year or so, basically the market has wanted the Fed to be less hawkish. And if you remember back a few years, you remember the big snafu that happened in December of 2018, Jerome Powell made some comments and then he had to back them up. The market at that point, and maybe for the year following, sort of strong armed the Fed, mm -hmm. right? The market said, you can't do it that way. Here's what we want. And the Fed succumbed to the pressure. Now things are different. Where the market wants a certain thing, the Fed continues to send a different message and the market has come around. So far, that's how it's gone this cycle. The market has come around to the Fed's message. So let me ask you this question. Market's doing extraordinarily well uh -huh. with rates where they are. Uh -huh. And I've said this, and I this is a bit of a rhetorical question because I think I know what your answer is going to be, but people should, they think they want rate cuts. It's mm -hmm. be careful what you wish for. Mm -hmm. I mean, my sense is the farther they push this out, I think the more beneficial, I know that's somewhat counterintuitive, but it suggests that things aren't breaking and there's no reason for them. I mean, I don't know why, given everything I'm seeing today, there would be a rush for them to cut rates. It makes no sense to me. No, the only the only thing I can come up with is that it would support valuations a little bit more and that we don't have such a logical way to say valuations are inflated at this level of rates. And maybe it would alleviate some of the pressure and concern that we have about the maturity wall, the corporate debt mm -hmm. maturity wall, and the cost of funds just generally in the economy. And mm -hmm. people want looser financial conditions because the market goes up when there are looser financial conditions. So if that's the case, then I can understand maybe why you would suggest that cuts are okay. But some, I mean, we've talked about it many times. The market gets nervous and the market tends to balk at it when cuts begin. Sometimes it's right when the cuts begin. Sometimes it's very shortly afterwards. That's why you don't want to wish for it. But I think actually more importantly right now, the reason we don't want to wish for it is that because the inflation problem has not been entirely solved, if they cut too soon, we overheat and we go right back into a situation yeah. where we're fighting it, we're chasing our tail if we didn't finish the job the first time. Yeah, I mean, just think about what's going on, just some of the data that we've been digesting over the last few weeks or so. We saw unemployment tick up, mm -hmm. we've seen inflation like stop going down, you know what I mean, to some degree, and, and maybe in some places start to pick up a little bit. I mean, like, you know, guy, you use this expression all the time, you know, the sorts of stuff that makes the Fed's job that much harder. And I think you've been saying this really well. I mean, like, listen, you know, you, you, you've you had some very pointed criticism about the Fed, but you, I think back to 17 and 18 on CNBC's Fast Money when, when Fed Chair Powell came in and he started raising interest rates and they attempted to normalize him. And then when he was doing raising interest rates again, you know what I mean? To, you, you thought he was a little late, you know, to kind of identify the inflation problem in 2021. But the fact that they've stayed the course, the fact that they've stuck it out yeah. through a bear market. You know what I mean? Through last year, again, the, the financial conditions thing, that's going to be a hard one. But, you know, listen, they might be able to kind of land this plane and, and let's bring it to the stock market for a second. Forget mm -hmm. the economy because none of us are economists. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When I think about the S&P 500, you know, it's doing okay. The dollars rallied back a little bit. Crude oil's rallied back. You mentioned copper. Um, you know, we have rates, you know, at 430 or something like that. Um, we've just had rate cuts pushed out, right? At like three months ago, um, when the S&P was much lower, there were six rate cuts priced in for 2024. Now we have three. I mean, maybe there's a way to, for them to do a little bit of a dance here where they can continue, you know what I mean? Not where investors are expecting rate cuts and they can kind of try to get inflation to a place where they want to be without distorting the job market and, and, and slowing the economy too much. Fair, and you're differentiating the economy and the market yeah. correctly. Now, the problem, of course, is going to be at some point, those two are going to intersect again. Yeah. So as much as they'd like to compartmentalize and say they're mutually exclusive, I think the problem is going to, it's going to manifest itself in, again, my opinion, the unemployment rate going a lot higher, a lot faster than people realize. And I think you saw a glimpse of that with the last reading. The revisions have been uh, negative 10 out of the last 12 months in a significant way. I think that catches up. The fact that inflation, there's a reacceleration, which we thought would happen, of these inflationary pressures manifesting itself in the PPI number that we saw, I guess it was last week, in the CPI mm -hmm. a couple of days prior to the PPI. And I think that creates a big problem for them. And that obviously has a huge impact on the economy, I think, and subsequently will have an impact on the stock market. And I think that's when those two lines, which are running seemingly in parallel now, will intersect at the wrong yeah, time. And, and I guess, Liz, I'm going to throw it to you for a second here. And then it comes down to S&P earnings, mm -hmm. right? Like, like mm -hmm. that's that's the thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And again, I, I like, like, you know, I don't, 
I was convinced that double digit earnings growth for this year seemed like a, like just a, like a dream. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we track fact sets, earnings, insight analysis. And we're going to get some more stuff from Butters tomorrow. But again, you know, Q4 into Q1, at least estimates for, for Q1, they come down as they always do, but they haven't come down that much. Right. It might be back end loaded. You know, mm -hmm. I, so so talk to us a little bit about what you're feeling about valuation. And, and I want to talk. Uh, a little bit. Yuri and Timmer, who's been on the pod with us on, on the tape a couple JT. times, he, he had a really great thread. On, there's still good threads on Twitter. Some threads, not so good, guys. Some get you a little fired well, up a little bit. You know. All right, we're going to put this thread in the show notes here. But but again, he's doing some scenario analysis with basically you know a PE on a level mm -hmm. of earnings and mm -hmm. where the S&P... Talk to us a little bit. Valuation, not a good timing tool, but if we bring it back to what earnings expectations are and where they, how they might basically outperform, mm -hmm. the S&P is not so expensive historically right now. Well, it depends what the what the relative metric is. If you're looking at it just on earnings, there are certainly pockets of the S&P that are not all that expensive. If you're looking at it based on different regimes, which is what Mario and I have done for a while, mm -hmm. different regimes of the 10-year treasury yield, mm -hmm. it is pretty expensive. So. The the thing about but relative to inflation, because um, that's the thing. I mean, like like because we have not had real yields, right? Like yeah. like what, if you're just going to kind of think about where inflation is and well, where the ten year is, like that's not something that we in in the last twenty five years we've had to deal with, right? That's true. That's very true. So so here's the thing about inflation, and this is just headline CPI. There's a sweet spot. In headline CPI, when it's between one and three percent, if you look, if you do a long term chart of CPI versus the S and P, between one and three percent, the S and P actually does pretty mm -hmm. well, or does okay at least, right? You don't see big drawdowns between that because that is the period where, whether correctly or not, that's when investors say we should be comfortable with what inflation looks like, and generally speaking, the rest of the economic indicators feel reasonably comfortable as well. So we're if we're looking at PCE, we're right in that zone and things seem like they should be going okay. So compared to historical ranges of CPI, inflation is maybe a little bit higher than we would want it to be for the S&P to find more upside. But when you think about valuations, people all the time, self-included, say they're not a good timing mechanism. And they're not. They're terrible. If you look at a PE today and that you expect that to tell you whether or not you should buy that stock today and what's going to happen in the next six months, it's not going to. But what it can tell you is that if that PE is relative to itself, relative to its peer group, relative to its sector, higher than usual, that the forward returns are likely muted or maybe underwhelming. But then what does forward return mean? Mm -hmm. Five to 10 years at least. That, that regression model doesn't really have statistical significance mm -hmm. until you take it out at least five years, but more so 10 to 15 years. Here's the rub with that. What investor today has 10 years of patience. Nobody does. So we can talk about PEs all day long and whether or not they're useful, whether or not they're overinflated or attractive. But the reality is if you're going to buy that, you have to buy it with the expectation that you're just going to hold it for 10 years and nobody is. You know, I look at things like bank credit is contracting by any metric you want to look mm -hmm. at. And obviously the bigger banks continue to get bigger. The the important banks for the consumer, like the small and mid-sized banks, are clearly um, co not compromised, but they're pulling things close to the vest. They're playing things very so credit contracting in a in a in economy that is contingent upon and relied upon credit, relying upon jobs and you know and relying upon people spending. So you throw all that together, that's our economy. Well, if unemployment starts to tick up like I think it will. We are already look at, at the credit conditions. I mean, U.S. consumer debt right now is north of seventeen and a half trillion dollars. We've talked about this credit card debt north of one point one five trillion, at an average rate of about twenty two percent, at the exact wrong time in the cycle. I think so. If those things start to really hit home, as I believe they will, the economy is going to falter, and earnings almost by definitions are going to start to contract, and by definition. On top of that, valuations will be yeah. uh, excessive. Let's throw that KRE chart up again. Okay, so this is the S&P Regional Banking ETF. And I think this speaks to what you're talking about, Guy. And, you know, we had Drew McKnight, who's the co-CEO of Fortress, on with us. On uh, It's going to drop on Monday mm -hmm. on the B block of the pod that we do with you. We do oh. the On the Tape podcast on Monday. We do that with That's you. Right. Drew and Caitlin Malin from iConnections are going to be on the B block with us in the Off the Tape segment. We talked about some of these issues in a way. And it's interesting. When you look at this regional 
banking chart. Now let's throw up the BKX. And when you look at them, so the BKX, and Drew made this point, <clears throat> we'll just kind of, kind of, and he was actually on CBC's Fast Money last night. You know, JP Morgan and some of the largest players in this index have gobbled up, right? Like all of the opportunity set that used to be there for the KRE, right. and now they're contracting. But here's the one, okay, and maybe we can hit the banks later. But this is what you're most focused on, Liz, heading into tonight is not bank balance sheets. It's actually mm. the central bank's balance sheet, right? So <laughs> right. So let's focus on this a lot because I hear a lot about this and what this might mean for liquidity and the like here. But mm -hmm. this is one where I think a lot of investors want a bit more clarity. On. And I think Elizabeth tweeted about this. Oh, she might have done. So, Are you on the Twitter? I am. Oh, That's how I learned oh, about yeah. some of the things yeah, I learned about I earlier today. All right. So you oh. tweeted this morning. Yeah. Okay. What did you tweet? Uh, it's the platform formerly known as Twitter. Oh, that's a guy okay. will never do okay. that. Okay. Never well, okay. So this the is Milwaukee what I Brewers still play at County Stadium. <laughs> okay. I mean, there's certain things. <laughs> Jay is still. No. Jay is still. Whether you like to admit it or not. Anyway, it's please, Shea. please yeah. continue. Yeah, and, and now it's American Family. <laughs> no, I understand what it, it is Miller now. Park still, but whatever. It's County Stadium. Yeah. Okay. What will you do? Oh, really quick. Sorry. What will you do when your beloved? Don't Yankees, even say that. Is no, no, that no, ever going to happen? No. No. Can I say? Don't even. First of all. Stadium. There's never in a million effing years at Yankee Stadium. Okay, no, maybe not in his life. You... Uh, it's, that's like the vat. Well, no, it's fair. I only have a few years left. I what? get it. Is the Vatican going to have like you know they're going to be sponsored, sponsored by, by Motorola, you think, you think Pepsi? Old, you think the old lady <laughs> wafers? Her? You think she's like reading the obituaries every day just to see waiting what, for what, me to you, go? Wait, are you suggesting that the Yankees are a religious institution? No, 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 no. no it's not what I'm <laughs> suggesting. But you know they are. That Yankee Stadium is a cathedral of sports. Yeah. Uh -huh. So in some ways, it is a religious event without a religious okay. experience when right. you go there, as opposed to some of these other places, which like, are shitholes. Like Shea. Like Shea. Yeah. Oh. And I don't know how we got on. Oh, you said I, I, Twitter. My, my bad. All right. Sorry. So Amanda's let's like, about, I'm yeah, sure Amanda, she's yeah. just. Yeah. yeah, she's not here. Um, okay. So there's a chart. It's, it's very colorful. There it is. There it is. Tweeted this today. Because we we focus so much on rates, we focus so much on every single thing that Jerome Powell says. Uh, there's been one presser, by the way. This is like a little game I play with myself. One presser in the last, I think, year and a half, where he hasn't worn a purple tie. It was a silver tie. We'll see what happens today. Really, I wait for it every time, and it's a purple tie every time. But anyway, the the top line in this chart is purplish. Basically, here's what's happening. You've got bank reserves, the reserves that banks are required to maintain. And what's been happening over the last, let's call it year and a half or so, is that banks have had excess reserves. So that's where that dark purplish line is above the yellow shaded portion. That is on its way down. Not, a, not necessarily a bad thing, but it is on its way down. And this is happening in concert with quantitative tightening. So the Fed rolling things off of its balance sheet. What happened so far, the reason that part of the reason that quantitative tightening has not had a negative effect or has not had so much of a tightening effect is because a lot of the securities that the Fed has put out into the secondary market were absorbed by the reverse repo facility. The reverse repo facility is what you see at the bottom of this chart, which mm -hmm. is on its way to zero. So as that runs out, there's no other option to absorb quantitative tightening except for the excess money that is in the system, which is the top of this chart. So what Mario and I are sort of projecting or foreshadowing is we may start to hear something from the Fed about the fact that they're going to have to slow down the tightening program, the QT program, or perhaps talk about when an end of it is appropriate. Because if they get to a point where the market does have to absorb all of those securities that they're rolling off and the reserve balance gets to that sort of yellow shaded mm -hmm. part, they don't want it to get too much tighter than that. So another thing to watch, and and maybe just a reminder in its simplest sense, this is just a reminder that rates are not the only thing that we need to pay attention to. With that said, a hundred and again, a picture is worth a thousand words, but the wheels are in motion. Like that has been set in motion mm -hmm. now. So regardless of any commentary, that will continue for a period of time. That trajectory, put it back up, will continue. And then, you know, it can it can turn at a certain point, but you know, those lines, those lines that you start seeing going into the yellow and subsequently probably going into the pink will continue regardless. So that's been set in motion. Is mm -hmm. that accurate? I think that's fair. All things held equal. Yes. yes. Yeah. Now there are things like, let's say suddenly there was a huge stimulus package that went out and yeah. we gave a hundred percent, a trillion dollars in cash. The cash has to go somewhere. They deposit it into bank accounts. That excess reserve number goes up. again, Right. right? So this is all things held constant. 
that that's probably the trajectory. All right, let's put let's pull up the S and P. You had another tweet, the S and P five hundred. Um, let's storm. let's look at this thing, and we've been tracking this kind of uptrend that's been in place from the October lows. And if you just kind of look at this here, it's kind of held that uptrend like a like a boss. Yeah, like a boss. You see that fifty day moving average also in purple. That seems to be a, a popular color. It's my with favorite you, color, Liz. actually. Um, oh. Look at how far it is above that lonely two hundred day moving average down there, guys. Oh, yeah, the yeah. Line. So. <laughs> so i mean listen at some point there's going to be a test of that 50 day right and and the question is does it fill in that gap from you know a month ago or so i mean like you know listen everything we got a vix at 14 you know what i mean we got a move index of the treasury uh yield you know the, the mm -hmm. measures of volatility there it's at you know 52 week or multi-year lows it's just everybody seems so complacent I everything mean, seems so well, happy with where things are and we're going to look at yields in a second but yeah. this one you could look at this in another way this is holding that uptrend exactly. it looks like it's going to make a, a push to the upper bound guy exactly well i mean you look at it and you say what what's not to like yeah. right it is an upward trending channel it it's obvious that momentum is part of that but if we look back towards the end of october mid-november that's when that began and if we can remember back to what the debates were then is this a lasting rally is it going too fast is it going to lose steam very quickly and then it didn't lose steam and it's created this upward sloping line the reason that we tweeted this it was more because it started to test the lower <laughs> bound of that trend so who knows if it breaks through it's obviously not the first time that it's tested that but the narratives that you can if you just replay what's happened over the last few months the narratives are okay the s p is making higher lows and higher highs that's generally a positive thing this shows it illustrated now even if it tests that that lower bound doesn't mean that it's going to blow through and suddenly drop it could test it and then just kind of churn sideways for a while which again not a terrible thing maybe that's just resilience right and and people maintaining risk appetite yeah and, and it's interesting you know we, we spent a lot of time in the s p 500 but the qqq is the one that's really interested to me like or interesting to me the nasdaq 100 and again you know those same six or seven stocks that make up let's say 30 percent of the weight of the s p 500 make up nearly 50 percent of the weight of the nasdaq 100 they're really driving the train and when you look at this we have a one-year chart of the qqq you see that it's just you know it's kind of testing that upper uh that, that that uptrend that's been in place from the october lows there you see how the line is drawn you see that breakout level um you see where that rising 200 day moving average that is very soon going to be what guy calls or do I call it a hundred? You do. Later? I never okay. heard of it until right. you and but, Brian but, Kelly but, talked yeah, about yeah. it. <laughs> and so again, there's another, there's a gap to be filled, you know, going back a month or so. And let's see how it acts on that first movement lower below that uptrend in what feels like, you know, five or six months or so. And I just want to make one point that, you know, we're getting towards quarter end here. And sometimes it makes some sense to get a, you know, get a view of what the market is pricing as far as movement. We just use the term complacency. When I look at the QQQ and I want to figure out what the options market is implying between now and March 28th. Okay. So we have a holiday on March 29th. So that will be the last day of the month, the last day of the quarter. I can look at the, at the money straddle in the QQQ to kind of do a back of the napkin, uh, way to figure out the implied movement between now and a specific date. So if I look at the March 28th, the weekly, quarterly, monthly, whatever you want to do, um, straddle, that would be the call premium at the money. Let's say, uh, we're trading right here at 439 or so and I take the put premium, you put those together and you get about $10. You divide by the strike price, which would be 439. It gets you about 2% implied move between now and the end of the day on March 28th. Why is quarterly stuff important? Sometimes you'll see bookmarking. Sometimes you'll see rebalancing. But when I think about an implied move and I use the at the money straddle to do this, if you just take the put or the call, let's just say you wanted to buy one because you're bullish. Directionally, you directionally bullish or bearish. Bullish or bearish, right. or bearish that is 1%. Mm -hmm. That's what the options market is implying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it like, so 2% implied move in either direction, but if you're bullish and you want to buy the at the money call, cost you 1%. I think that's really interesting. It speaks to the level of complacency. Kind well, of. And if just look at that. The calls cost 550, <clears throat> excuse me, and the puts cost four and a half dollars. Again, the skew, we've talked about this yeah. before, and that, that might not be striking, but we've seen it very striking in other individual stocks. So keep that in mind. Keep that last chart of the Qs in mind. And now put up an SMH chart because to me, and we've talked about this before, this is the driver of everything. Yeah. And as we have mentioned, so I think 28% of the SMH now is NVIDIA. And we talked about those prior double tops and then off to the races back in December. This is going to look in the longer term chart. I think you'll see exactly what we're looking at in terms of that uptrend 
and in terms of those prior highs, you know, we've talked about 164 being what should be resistant or support now yeah. was prior resistance. And I'll say this, I'm not a hater, but we teased NVIDIA. I'll go back two Fridays ago to that reversal, that intraday reversal of a quarter trillion dollars from peak to trough, and then the subsequent trading, and there have been some good days and bad days, but here we are sitting at about 885 or thereabouts. I will say again that I think that Friday may have marked a short-term top in this name. And if this starts to give it up, the SMH is vulnerable. If the SMH becomes vulnerable, then the QQQs become vulnerable. Yeah, and I'll just say this about the semis. I mean, you look at NVIDIA. They had this huge event these last couple of days. The whole market seemed very focused on it. We talked about it yesterday. Jensen Wang, the CEO of this company, he's not some Johnny come lately. He's been there for 31 years, stepped out in front of an audience of about 16 or 17,000 people. You would have thought he was like on the Eras tour or something like that. Let's go back to that chart huh? for a second here. Uh, that would be the T-Swizzle tour. By the way, I'm not... Listen, I I, no, it's not about T-Swizzle. A man is going to mad at me again. And this is just a stylistic thing. Yeah. Napkins don't have backs, uh, backs and fronts. Well, they do if there's writing. Well, no, that's... Well, I, you, I mean, it's envelopes. Well, so you... <laughs> I'm just saying. No, and I'm not trying... You know where just, that came up from? I don't like, know. I think it was like a thing back in the 50s. If you were like in Mad Men or something, you're meeting You write somebody. on napkins. Well, you listen, you're at the sort of place that might have writing on the front of the napkins saying... Where so you like, flip it around. Yeah, you'd flip it over yeah. and you and Don Draper would like do a deal on the back of a napkin. That's where that came from. Really quickly, though, back to the semis. Like draw that chart out of NVIDIA. It's been grinding. Okay. So so since that period that you talked about, let's just kind of widen that out a little bit. Um, that that reversal day uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I want to just show that it's basing now. No, no, stretch it out a little bit longer, it's much shorter. Um, and you see that it's basing here. So we had all that great news, right? Mm -hmm. And so now let's pull up AMD for a second. So AMD also had a big reversal guy on that day that we were talking about. And it's interesting about AMD that now this has a $280 billion market cap. That was almost equivalent to the reversal in the intraday reversal in NVIDIA that day. AMD is now down 22% from its highs that day. Let's pull up Broadcom, comes out AVGO. This company reported a couple weeks ago and has barely seen an uptick, okay? And it was rallying a, a, a good deal off of their exposure mm -hmm. in the generative AI space. So I just think it's important to mention. And then the last one, we talked about it yesterday, Supermicro, SMCI, added to the S&P 500 on Monday. They announced that, hey, listen, investors, you want stock? Do you guys have been buying the crap out of this thing. We'll give you a stock. Here's $2 billion worth of it. And you and I agree, smart move. But these are the sorts of things that have the potential to break momentum. And so I just wanted to make that point that it's all kind of happening this week. Shortly. I have a question. So when you look at, because that that's a pretty clear theme and I hadn't actually put that, this is interesting. When you look at all of those together, you can see that they are very obviously losing steam and mm. maybe just moving sideways. Do you see that as a precursor to a drawdown or is it just that we have exhausted this leg up and now we've we've hit the ceiling Basing and, for the and next that's well that's that's the rub right and i think depend and i don't know the answer to that question it's the right question i think depending on what lens you're looking at it i look at this and say we may have specifically nvidia but some of these other names may have exhausted ourselves on that friday two fridays ago you'll go back and say ah that was the day that things got really interesting you see that engulfing pattern and the subsequent price action sideways. I mean, to me, that suggests, this is just the way I look at it, we have a leg lower on the back of it. That's how I look at it. But And quickly about AMD, and Dan, I'm sure has some thoughts. AMD is its own animal without question, but when they reported, we were in Miami, Florida, Elizabeth was with, we were in South Beach, you were down there. They reported, I think it was January 31st, the stock closed at 168 or thereabouts. We talked about the quarter, which was fine. The guidance was not great. Stock was lower in the after hours, traded down to 163 and a half, 164, and then proceeded to make a beeline to 227. I understand why, but clearly not on the back of anything yeah. fundamental. And now here we are, round tripped almost the entire thing. So when I see something like that, that's a sign as well. Yeah, so let's put this together in a little bit of a mosaic, and we have a piece of a data that's coming out today after the close in Micron's earnings, and I think it's going to be really important. So like the combination of this like, exuberance in and around NVIDIA into this GTC event, mm -hmm. the uh, exuberance of SMCI, Supermicro, being added to the S&P 500, but then doing a share offering, right? A company like AMD, or at least its stock, 
um, that had a huge reversal and is now in serious correction territory. Technically, it's breaking some levels. And now we have Micron. And if we just want to pull up Micron's chart for a second here. So about a month ago, Micron was trading below $80. About two weeks ago, it was trading above $100. Mm -hmm. You see that rally. You see that reversal. You see that consolidation right now. Okay, so after the close tonight, we have earnings. The implied move is about 10% in either direction. This company has rallied in lockstep with some of the hyperscalers, with some of the chip makers, because all of these Gen AI chips that are going into these high-end servers and, and, and the like here to train these large language models, they need memory. And that's what Micron does, a tremendously cyclical source of business but if you believe in this secular shift this is going to be huge and micron could be going into a major mega cycle but if they don't if they're not able to meaningfully beat or guide higher you know what mm -hmm. i mean tonight the stock's going down like, like it's just that simple and we can pull up adobe as a great example we pulled up broadcom before if they can't back it up with the current quarter that they're reporting and the guidance that they're giving then investors are shooting first and asking questions later and so that's one of the reasons why guy i think we're starting to see some of these very large implied moves for some of these stocks that have moved a whole heck of a lot in sympathy with some of the other players that are putting up the numbers and the guidance day adobe reported Prior to that move, it was the 40th largest company in the world, yeah. four zero, just for perspective. And that stock moved 14% in the course of a couple hours. And, you know, you're, all the points you're making are well taken. And I think it, it goes back to what David Einhorn said a couple months ago about the market structure. I think he used the term broken. And I used the term sort of different, although I understand what he's saying. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is not the sign, in my opinion, of a healthy market. When you see moves of that magnitude, in stocks or companies of that both size, ways. Means both ways because we're seeing huge up gaps, and down. You know, like like huge gaps. Yet the new all when we go, highs, but yeah. when we go high, when we go yeah, higher, people, it's normal. It's normal. Yeah. When we go lower, it's the cause of some consternation because wait a second, these are not supposed to happen. It's just something to look at because Elizabeth, I don't think again, I'm not playing stock market here, but just in terms of the way the market operates, that does not suggest a healthy market to me. Well, it suggests that there's sensitivity, I think. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's weird. It, it completely flies in the face of the fact that the VIX, I just pulled up the VIX, a long-term chart of the VIX at 13.9. So if we're that sensitive to some of these headlines about specific companies or we're that sensitive to some of the macro headlines or just the, the sentences that Jerome Powell says, a VIX at 13.9 just doesn't make sense. And I'm not <clears> saying <throat> that I want the VIX to be higher, but I talk about this a lot. It's some of that the inconsistencies in relationships. I'm not going to say that that means the market isn't functioning properly, but some of the relationships just are not intact right now. Different another big time. one, another big one is the real yields and PEs and just the divergence that's yeah. happening. Now, I'm not saying that one of them is wrong and the other is right, but the relationship right now is dislocated. Yeah. Should we go to Q&A? Well, because... really quickly, just before we go to Q&A, you know, Guy, you've mentioned this, I, I feel like, for a year and a half or so, and it really was in this rate hiking cycle with the Fed, the volatility in the 10-year Treasury yield, mark, you know, like that is not something that, you know, you thought was particularly normal. Let's just pull that chart up for a second because this is probably likely to be more volatile than the stock market at first, depending upon what the Fed has to say or so. We got back to that kind of 4.3 level. You see that technical resistance there. Okay, maybe on the 10-year Treasury yield, technicals are not that important, mm -hmm. but it seems to be playing out a little bit. You see that uptrend that's been in place. You see it get above that 200-day moving average. Liz, what would you expect? Let's just say Fed Chair Powell remains very consistent with what we heard from him you know, mm -hmm. a, a month ago or so, and it comes out a bit hawkish, but we know at some point they want to cut rates at some point. What do you think the yield move is going to be? What, what do you think the knee jerk, assuming that they do not hint to sooner than expected? And let's pull up the CME Fed Funds tracker uh, here for a second, because Obviously, you know, really what's happening is you have to look at June for the CME Fed Fund Tracker, and it's about a 60% probability right now of a 25 basis point cut. But that is the thing that's likely to move a lot, too. Yes. So I will say I think that he is going to sound hawkish mm -hmm. or let me be very specific. I think the market is going to interpret him as sounding hawkish mm -hmm. because the market has interpreted him as sounding more dovish mm -hmm. than I think he actually has been. So I think that there is going to be some effort on his part to be like, hey, guys, you're not listening. 
And he's done that a few times in the past. And I do think that the Fed right now is trying really hard to make sure that they're the ones that lead this game mm -hmm. instead of the other way around with the market leading them. So I think that the market will interpret today as hawkish, maybe not dramatically so, mm -hmm. but a little bit. The yield move, I just pulled up uh, CPI, headline CPI, just as a gauge. So when the 10-year yield hit 5%, where do you think headline CPI was? So this was, let's say this was 4%. August. Uh, this was... August. It was 3.7% in September. Okay. Then it dropped down to 3.2% in October, but we've kind of held steady there 3.4, 3.1, 3.2. If the Fed's projection for inflation rises in this summary of economic projections, I think you do see a big jump in yields, but that's probably across the curve. All right. So if we get a big jump in yields, guys, so let's say you've been saying it could go to four or five pretty easily. Yeah. Where's the S&P? Because the well, last time the 10-year yield was at four or five, again, inflation wasn't too far away from where it is right now mm -hmm. and it stopped going down. The S&P was much lower. We play that game on Fast Money. I do it with Melissa. If you told me all these yeah. things would happen, then say, okay, where's the S&P? I'm wrong most of the time. So, but I'll try again here under those circumstances, you know, four and a half percent, 10 years suggest we're significantly lower in the S and P that would be, yeah, that would be how I would interpret the entire thing. Unfortunately, I shouldn't say, unfortunately, the, the reality of the situation is the market has confounded and surprised me so many times over the last few years in terms of things that I thought I knew that came to be true Thought the market would do one thing, it does something entirely. All right, so the different. last point I'll just say is the last time that we were on our way down from four and a half, right, to three point eight, and now we're on the way. Down. The S and P was like forty six hundred, a little bit below that. Now think about this. There's one thing that I think because we're further out in time, the stock market is also interpreting a bit stronger of an economy than maybe we thought the mm -hmm. last time around, mm -hmm. and better earning support. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. so that's one of the reasons why you say, all right, we're up about ten percent. So maybe that's it. I don't know. I think we. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's fair. I think that's. But, and, you know, and frankly, that's true yeah. right now. GDP has been stronger than expected. Yeah. Earnings have been stronger than expected. Well, and we have a lot more data. The consumer to... continues yeah. to spend. Mm -hmm. There haven't been a big wave of defaults, right? There hasn't been this shoe that dropped. So in this <clears throat> moment in time, that is a fair statement. Q&A, because Elizabeth has to leave. She's leave. got an Audi, what, 5,000? Yeah. People say that still? Yeah. Well, you say it. By the way, I sent Amanda, mean? and not that, again, Amanda's, but I sent Amanda, because uh, whilst you were talking, I looked it up just to see. And as it turns out, Whilst. back of the envelope is a thing. A similar phrase in the United States is back of the napkin. Mm -hmm. So there you go. I like my little madman thing because I'd like to think of myself in the madman. You know, what, what's that? What's I that swanky bar that. that's in the Plaza Hotel, you know, on 57th? And Elaine's, not Elaine's, no, no, no. where Eloise used to be. No. The, the oval bar, the one where they have No, tea? it's the. Uh, you think know. about I'll, that. I'll, I'll, I'll figure flat. it out. No, Let's go. Beautiful bar in the corner. QA portion like of that. the show. Because Elizabeth has to mm. leave. Yeah. Um, from Griffin Keenan. And this is actually, I like this question. Thoughts on dollar yen and the possible implications for the market, any implications being overlooked? Okay. Dollar yen is now trading one, I don't know if we can pull up a chart, 151.55 ish. This is the weakest the yen has been, strongest the dollar has been in quite some time. You saw that prior high, it had a dramatic sell off down to 142. Bank of Japan intervened. You had that subsequent high came off on the hopes that they would sort of get things in order. They would start to raise rates. Guess what happened? They actually raised rates. The yen got weaker. What are the implications? Well, again, I'm not an economist, but I will tell you, Japan, which was the third largest economy in the world, has now been usurped by Germany, I believe. So it's now, I think, number four. And this is devastating mm -hmm. for, their, for their populace, for the people of Japan, for their consumers. They have to intervene in their yen, the, the weakness cannot continue. But in order to do so, they have to pull a couple of levers. And that's when I think more and more people are going to start to talk about the weakness in the yen permeating into other risk assets. We're clearly not seeing it yet. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he brought up the question suggests that I think on the surface, more and more people are starting to pull their head out of there. You know what? And take a look. Well, it, it doesn't usually happen this way. If you raise rates, right. usually the currency strengthens. So Again, this is a relationship that is dislocated. Something's going on here. Part of it is that 
Japan had held an interest rate policy that was so low for so long. So they're behind the eight ball. And when you do it as a relative game, which currency is always a relative game, you compare it to interest rates around the globe and other currencies around the globe, they still look pretty weak and pretty low by an interest rate differential. But Again, and again, what was it? We figured this out a few weeks ago, 34 years for their stock market to yeah. take it back to prior high. Mm -hmm. So they've got a lot of work to do. And there is a lot of money. And I think that this is something that the average investor doesn't know or doesn't understand. There's a lot of money tied up in that carry trade still with the yen. There's a lot that could ripple through markets if things get too volatile, but I do think the central bank will intervene before it gets to be that big of a deal. This is an interesting question by OGP25. Hi, Dan, uh, EY guy. He's not an economist, but why is the economy doing well? Well, I'll try to, I'll take a stab at this and we discussed it. The economy isn't NVIDIA. The economy isn't AI. The economy isn't any of the things that we look at. The economy is 73% driven by people buying shit and spending money. That's general. That is basically what the US economy is. As long as people have jobs, which the unemployment rate suggests they do, and as long as people are not scared by anything, which currently they're not, people will spend money, regardless of whether or not they should be spending money. I say that all the time. Never underrate, underestimate the U.S. consumers want to spend. They will spend until something scares them. And when something scares them, like a stock market event or some exogenous event, consumer spending stops on a dime. Go back to October 2018 into Christmas of that year, and you can see how quickly it happens. And that's because the stock market sold off. Dan, how much? 19.9%. 19.9%. Thank you, Dan, for being so engaged with that. But yes, yeah, so <laughs> the answer to that question is the economy is people spending. People are clearly spending. Whether or not people should be spending is what we debate all the time. Well, we do debate it. And, and I think a lot of people will spend even if they shouldn't. The credit piece is something that continues to haunt me really that there's there's so much outstanding consumer debt that doesn't seem to be causing that much of a problem and for a while we were talking about car loans being the issue and i don't know what happened to that story because i'm pretty sure there's still an issue and how many people are underwater on their car and what happens when those loans come or what happens when people can't quite pay every single bill anymore you have to keep in mind which bills they stop paying first but still at this point they're paying them. They're spending and they're paying them. Yeah, I think it's also important to note that this is also a reflection of their confidence in their wages and their jobs mm -hmm. and, you know what I mean, and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, I, I can't remember what that expression is. It, it feels like a recession when, you know, your neighbor, when your loses, neighbor loses his or her yeah. job. It's a depression yeah. when you lose yeah. yours. Yeah. yeah. And so, again, you know, unless we see, you know, unemployment pick up materially and, and at this point, you know, a recession would be the thing to do that. But if you've been betting on a recession and you've been reflecting that view in, the, in in your inability to let's say put money to work in the stock market over the last call it 14 or 15 months or so mm -hmm. since the bottom in late 2022 it's been a tough road to hoe can we get an update on the gdx trade sure let's do that dan because gdx i want to say it was around 30 ish when we talked it's about like this 29 and a half or 29 something. and all right yeah. it's 29 15 yeah. right now so effectively hasn't moved it's moved slightly lower here's the update you know i understand Gold is obviously been going sideways for a while. The miners had that brief run to the upside, been going sideways since. I will tell you, DJ Chapman, I still like it. I am clearly in the minority out there. There are not a lot of people that like the miners, and quite frankly, they've been right not to. I mean, they've been in a downtrend now since basically mid-2020, but I still think they'll be reckoning when the underlying commodity has its move to the upside like I think it will have. The catch-up trend in the miners, I think, will be significant. Yeah, there. and again, I, I want to just, you know, because we're going to be doing more of these options trades and kind of like expressing our views, um, you know, in many cases with defined risk. And one of the situations with like GDX, I think a lot of you guys know, I'm not like a gold guy, um, but Guy made what I thought was a really interesting case for why GDX should play some catch up with gold, which is trading at all time highs. And after that move like that, like the idea of just buying the ETF and kind of trying to put a mental stop in of where you might do it, didn't make a lot of sense, which is why we detailed a, a defined risk way to play with calls or call spreads that like here. And you're basically setting a stop with that right there. So again, it's not something like to me, um, you know, it's not the sort of trades that that I am interested in from a fundamental standpoint, but I like the thought process of a catch up trade. And I like the idea of defining my risk to do it. I, I have a question from Liz oh, in I New York. Liz EY yeah. in New York. Yeah. So asking for a friend. Mm. If you own is that that little gold... friend that I like? No, no, who came to no, the, no. the range? You know, no, it's no, you, me, oh. myself, and I. Sorry. So, 
if you let's say you hypothetically own gold in ETF form or maybe the physical spot, whatever that thing is called, sprot, whatever. P H Y S. Correct. <laughs> let's say you own one of those, or perhaps both. If you think there's going to be a catch-up trade in the miners, do you rotate out of yeah, that's, uh, those I, ETFs and into the miners? It's a, the short answer is yes, you can do that. Although I do think the gold will be the first thing that moves. And in the, but the move in the miners, like if you think about it, gold's effectively, we've talked about this, gold's at an all-time high. Stock market's at an all-time high. Mm -hmm. Some of these miners, Newmont specifically, throw up a long-term Newmont chart. It's half of its all-time 50%, five zero, half of its all time high. Mm. So you would think, and I understand that there are a number of reasons why, but you would think the catch up trade would be significant. So throw up this chart if you want, real quick. And new market. NEM but comes out. NTM. -E By the way, <laughs> Elizabeth played Dorothy in her I in know. high school's oh, program. I know she's yeah. got to get out of here. I know, but real quick, but, that's, pull it up. but that maybe, is the maybe right they'll question. Pull it up. Uh, and I'll say, you know, you just, back just to throw that yeah. out there as well. So, yes. All right. All right. Before we get out of here, I want to pull up one thing. We mentioned this yesterday as it relates to Micron Guy. And we were taking, we were looking at a long-term chart. And um, look at this chart that we just put together. It's like basically a 25-year log chart of Micron. And, and believe it or not, people, Micron was at the forefront. You know, to do the internet back in the late 90s, mm -hmm. you needed DRAM, you needed memory and the like. So this is a log chart here. It's interesting that this is basically the first new high that we've seen going all the way back to 2000, right? So we look at that implied move about 10% either direction. You look at how these guys should be able to play in this secular shift. And it would not surprise me to see this stock break out and go up in line with that 10%. Yeah. And the flip side is it could do what Adobe did. And I don't think many people, I think the implied move guy was maybe eight or 9%. That stock was down 15% the next day. So the, the point I'm trying to highlight here is that no matter what input you use, whether it's valuation, whether it's technicals, whether it's what you think about an industry and how certain players are going to play, it could be a competitive thing. It could be a TAMP, whatever the heck it is. Like understand that like the, the volatility bands are widening right here at a level of high complacency in the broader market. And that's the thing I think it's important to keep your, uh, antennas up, but, but you know, I'll just say this: if I didn't have this kind of, I, I want to say, cynical bent towards at least the psychology around some of this this trading right now, that thing looks like it just wants to what guy? Uh, not party or party. It, it depends like on it which. To, I mean, it looks like it look. Wants to not party. that it matters, and I'm not saying this. And Elizabeth has yeah, to go. I mean, you're talking go. about Nvidia in the excuse me, Micron in the summer of 2000 was probably a hundred dollar ish stock. Yeah. Two and a half years later, was trading eight bucks just for perspective, like a lot of other things, by the way. And we've seen moves of this magnitude before. Elizabeth has a very smart suit on today, by the way. And we said when she walked in, she looks well, like she They just be, got a really good look at it. They just got be, a really good look at she it. She could be teaching at like a university here. Sure, she could do. If anybody knows, it's open. By, by, by the way, Liz, Elizabeth will be on the closing bell. Three o'clock. And I think it's uh, Mike Santoli, filling I think, is for filling Wapner. in for Scott Wapner. Break, so don't Wapner. suck. That was at Elizabeth. Um, but we want to take a couple more. I'll take, I got mm -hmm. one more for you. Okay. Uh, bear with me a second because this is single stock question. This is from Island Giza. Goldman Sachs, why is it still underperforming? Ooh. Well, it depends on what you're saying underperforming compared to. Compared to Morgan Stanley, it's probably done exactly the same thing. Compared to JP Morgan, clearly, mm -hmm. it's completely underperformed. Goldman Sachs is obviously not a bank in the way JP Morgan is. It's an investment bank. Yeah, It's probably performed as well as Morgan Stanley over a similar period of time. And it is approaching, I want to say, its prior all-time high, which I think we made, Dan, somewhere in the, the fall of 2021 or thereabouts. Yeah. So, you know, we're I think it was a north of a $400 stock at one point, and here we are now. Well, it's interesting. Price today, obviously, Goldman, Morgan Stanley. Stanley, you know, viewed to be investment banks that versus the money center banks. And so the underperformance, I think, of the investment banks over the last year has clear to do with, you know, the lack of capital markets activity that we've seen. There's definitely been some M&A and those guys have both been playing in, in, in there. But um, I just say that the money center banks were the ones that absorbed a, a lot of that. Let's call it what it is. Easy money mm -hmm. from the, the regional banking um you know, uh, crisis that we saw about a year ago. And that to me is pretty interesting. Let's back this thing out for one second though, and just look at that consolidation after that huge ramp off the October lows. I mean, guy, that looked like it was making new 52 week lows, looked like it was gonna make multi-year lows. And now you have this ramp and you just have this sideways action. That is quite peculiar to me. Mm -hmm. and, and if these, 
let's just say the Reddit does not perform well. And I actually don't expect the stock to do well. It might have a one day pop, two day pop. This is not a company that, in my opinion, has been around for 18 years. It's not particularly innovative. They're cutting a lot of costs and they're trying to kind of make it sound like a newfangled story on digital ads and how they're going to benefit from generative AI and, and people wanting to scrub their, you know, um, APIs and the like here. I just don't think there's an interesting story there. But to me, if these IPOs that are coming supposedly in the next you know month or two, and if you can't bring IPOs that work well, guy, in a market at all time highs like this, then when the hell are you going to bring them? This stock has been going sideways to slightly higher since the middle of December. It obviously had that ramp like many yeah. things into the end of December. So I think if you pull up again real quick before we get out of here, 375 is a level where if we were to break on the downside, obviously, I would start to get concerned because that sideway actions on a break of 375 would indicate to me that that was a topping formation, not a bottoming yeah, formation, or not a plateauing but formation. But then it's going right to 360, which is that mid-December breakout mm -hmm. level. All right, we did that. Uh, I enjoyed this. That was a lot of fun. EY from SoFi joined us. She was great. She was great. Um, back of the envelope, back of the napkin. Both are okay. What do you? What do you? You're an envelope. I'm guy. a back of the envelope guy because well, I still. Often, wait, wait, I, I still how use often do you have an envelope? Well, I know, but the point is, you're much likely to be around a napkin. Yeah, but and I mail things. But think about this: well, I've you're stamped. sitting down, you're sitting down with a buddy, and you're having a beer. No, and that beer is happen. put on I mean, a napkin. I, when when do you scotch, think the last time I was sitting down wine. with a buddy? If you're Eddie, at the Oak Room, okay, yeah, you and Don Draper at mm, the Plaza right. Hotel, Oak Room. So here's the deal: on that napkin, I guarantee you. OK, if you see on the front of the napkin, it's going to say the Oak Room, the plaza. Flip so that shit over. You're going to flip that shit over. You might even open it up ah. a book and you might get more surface area to write. You know, the problem is, of course, napkins, if you have something on it, they get a little damp and it's hard to write on a it damp. Depends. It, 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 there's condensation if there's something cold in the glass. Yeah. But if you had, let's say, some scotch yeah. that's not on the and rocks the, and the, or you had some red wine. It's not going to get damp. And the napkin is not conducive to, like, you could, like, rip the napkin when you try to do well, pen. Well, good quality napkin. See, that's the thing. I thought a lot of people, I think, are not focused on the quality, on the quality of, the of a napkin. If you go with a proper cocktail napkin, mm. you're going to be able to do that's a back hardy. of the napkin calculation. By the way, that. next show, maybe I'll, I'll do a little live tic-tac-toe for one of our audience That'd members oh my god you could you're so good at it would be amazed balls so i freak good. people out because right. it's like it's like almost like that mentalist dude so to owes. owes. Yeah. so tomorrow's thursday yeah we're gonna have carter braxton War no he's on vacation he's on va it's just me and you I and mean, like, and we're gonna have butters so I didn't say it. We're gonna have butter, bitch. Yes, yeah. we will. All right, let's do so it. listen, peeps. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Stay tuned, folks. This could get really interesting really quickly here. Yeah, See you later. Thanks a lot.